Hey everybody, Mike Iaconelli back out here in the shop. And I, I want to welcome you to the last part of the Ultimate Jig series. This is the last part to a series where we've flushed out everything about a skirted jig. And you know from the other episodes that a jig is probably the most versatile fish catching bass lure ever created. Different times of the year, different water conditions, different depths, different species of bass, different types of cover, everything, winter, summer, spring, fall, a skirted jig will catch them all. Did that just rhyme? I think it did. Uh, we talked about a lot of things with jig fishing, and I wanted this last part of this series to be about the right equipment. You could have all the information in the world about jig fishing and have the wrong rod, reel, line, and hook set, and you won't catch them. So I really wanted to end this last one. We're gonna to talk to you about picking the right rod and reel for the jigs. We're gonna to talk to you about the right line for different situations. And last but not least, we're gonna talk about detecting those bites and setting the hook, getting that hook driven home in the fish's mouth, okay? Let's start with the rods. Let's start with the rods. And I wanna single out for a second the micro jig category, okay? So we're gonna single out the micro jigs um, because the micro jigs are gonna get a different type of rod and reel than the other four jig categories, right? So compact jig, full-size jig, football jig, swim jig, they're going to get a type of rod. But for these little tiny micro jigs, we're going to use a good old spinning rod. We're going to use a spinning rod. And these micro jigs are small. Remember, they're ultra small. Most of them are an eighth, a three sixteenths, a quarter of an ounce with smaller light wire hooks. So our equipment for these micro jigs is going to be just a little different. And the right rod and reel to fish with a micro, especially in those small sizes, is a spinning combo. Um, here's what I want to tell you. A rod that's seven to seven and a seven four, seven and a half even, that's the right rod, but I am a big advocate of a seven foot medium action spinning rod. Seven foot medium action spinning rod. And the reason for that is I want a rod that has some tip, but I want a rod that has a little backbone, okay? When you look at a medium action spinning rod, it's what I call about a 60-40 rod. If I put a load on that rod, about 40% of it has flex, right, from about, I don't know, about that fifth guide, sixth guide up. But I also have a tremendous amount of backbone from that fifth or sixth guide down. And you need that. Medium light action spinning rod for these little jigs, it's too light. A medium heavy rod for these little tiny small hook jigs, micro jigs, it's too heavy. So a medium is right and you want that backbone to drive that single, little single hook home, okay? So seven foot medium action rod. On the reel, a 20 or a 30 sized spinning reel is the perfect complement. Uh, some of the companies are a 3000 or a 2000, but a 20 or a 30, I love this is that Abu Garcia Revo Ike 30, I love it. And then last but not least, the line. And for micro jig fishing, we're gonna use braid to a floral leader. And I like to use 10 or 15 pound braid. I'm a, I'm a big believer in Berkeley X5. I like the white because with the white braid, I can see it. And then I use a one to three foot leader of Berkeley Trilene fluorocarbon. I like the fluorocarbon on these micro jigs. And I'll usually use eight to 12 pound tests as my fluorocarbon leader. So perfect complement uh, to that light braid. 
The braid's gonna give me the casting distance, the instant hookup, the zero stretch, but the fluorocarbon is gonna give me um, a little bit of that natural action with the jig and the fish can't see it, okay? That's the micro jig, medium spinning. That's the only one that's gonna get the spinning rod, okay? Now let's get to the meat of this jig fishing thing. And now we're talking about all the rest of the categories, from a compact jig like a mini flip, to a full size, to a football, and finally to a swim jig. We're gonna use a casting rod. We're gonna use a bait caster. It's the right rod for these generally heavier jigs, right? You know, now we're talking about a quarter, three eighths, half ounce, even heavier if we're talking about those big footballs, right? We're talking about three quarter ounce, one ounce sometimes. But I want you to use a bait caster. And I'm, I'm gonna show you two rods, but I want you to use a rod that's seven foot to seven and a half foot that's medium heavy. A seven to seven and a half foot medium heavy casting rod. All right, I'm gonna show you the tip on this, just like I did with the spinning rod. And a medium heavy rod should be about 80, 20, 70, 30, depending on the rod you're using. This one's right about in the middle. This one's about, I'd say it's about 75% backbone, 25% tip, a medium heavy action. So look at that. From about right there, you start to see that flexible tip, but from that fifth, sixth guy down, backbone, man. And we need that backbone to drive home that big single hook on these skirted jigs. In a little bit, when I'm talking about the bite and the hook set, you're really going to understand why we want this medium heavy rod because of that hook set. But listen to me, one of the biggest mistakes I see anglers make with jig fishing in rod selection is picking too heavy of a rod. We don't want a heavy action or an extra heavy because that little bit of tip and that medium heavy, look at it. That 20 or 30% spongy tip, it's gonna help us. It's gonna help us make the cast, whether we're pitching or flipping or making a long cast, it's, it's like a rubber band, right? It's like, a, it's like a, a, an aid to help us get that jig in there, to load that rod. The other thing that tip is gonna do is when you feel that bite, we're gonna talk about it in a second, and you jack their asses. You hit them as hard as you can. I want that tip to give just a little bit before it loads into the, the meat of the rod. That's the perfect way to get them. A heavy or an extra heavy rod, a lot of times when you hit them, that tip, there's no flex to it. And you hit them too quick and too hard and you, you have a tendency to pull the hook out of a lot of them. So a seven to seven and a half foot medium action, uh, medium heavy action rod. My two favorite lengths, uh, I'm just gonna lay it down for you real quick. This is a 7.2 Ike series, Abu Garcia, medium heavy. I actually designed this rod especially for jig fishing. 7.2 medium heavy. Um, to me, this is the, jig rod I want to use when I'm pitching docks, when I'm making like roll casts, when things are a little closer to me, uh, when I'm casting out on break lines, but not bomb casting, normal casting, this is the rod. Docks, you're up close, you're personal, a super long rod hurts you. So I like the 7.2, it's perfect. And then the other one is, the Abu Garcia Ike Series 7.4 medium heavy. The 7.4 medium heavy is almost the same exact rod with two extra inches on the back of it, right? And I want this little bit longer rod when I'm fishing a really big jig. So if I go to that 
three quarter ounce or one ounce football. I like that little extra length. When I'm bomb casting a jig, really long, super long cast with a bigger jig, I like the 7.4. And last but not least, when I'm swim jig fishing, when I'm jig uh, swimming that jig, I like the 7.4 a little better than the 7.2. But it's basically the same rod. A medium heavy rod, 7.2, 7.4, they're both good. All right, let's talk about the reel. This goes for both of these rods. This goes for all of my bait casting needs when I'm jig fishing. And the main thing I wanna tell you on the reel is get a low profile casting reel that fits in your palm, right? It's nice in your palm, so if you're roll casting or you're flipping or you're pitching, whatever you're doing, feels good in your hand, but select a reel with a higher gear ratio when you're jig fishing. My rule of thumb is seven to one or greater. Seven to one or greater. I really, 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 really like the, uh, the Revo Ike baitcaster. It comes in two ratios, but the eight zero to one is my favorite ratio for jig fishing. And the main thing with that is, and we'll talk a little bit about it when we talk about the bite, is some of those bites hit it and come at you. You know, you flip out there, you cast out there, and all of a sudden you feel something, duh, 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 and you pick up, and it's almost like you don't even feel anything. Your line's coming at you. I really like that seven to one or greater, this is the eight to zero, for fast line recovery, boom, so you can hit them. Uh, really, 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 really encourage a faster gear ratio, low profile casting reel. All right, last but not least, let's talk about line. And I'm gonna give you a little percent breakdown on the types of line that I throw and why I throw them. 60 to 70% of the time I'm jig fishing. So that's more than half. I'm fishing all fluorocarbon to the knot. Fluorocarbon from the knot of the jig to the knot of the spool of that casting reel. And I love fluorocarbon when I'm jig fishing. And I'll give you a couple of the reasons. One, it's invisible. I love fishing stained and clean water when I can pitch that in there. I know the fish don't see the line. I love that. Two, it's got less stretch than mono. Mono is too stretchy. Fluorocarbon has a little stretch, but it's a lot less stretchy than mono. I love that. It's abrasion resistant. So a lot of times around hard cover, like wood, docks, brush, lay down trees, logs, braided line, there's zero stretch to braid. So braid actually digs into the wood. Fluorocarbon does not dig into the wood and it's pretty abrasion resistant for that line size that you're fishing. Last but not least, why I love fluorocarbon for jig fishing. You ready? This line is dense. Fluorocarbon sinks. So a dense sinking line means more natural action to that jig. Whether you have a chunk or a double tail grub, it's giving that jig a more natural fluid action, better action, okay? So about 60, 70% of the time, I use fluorocarbon, all fluorocarbon. And depending on the cover, depending on the size of the fish, I like 12 to 20 pound tests. But if I really had to settle in on a line size, the 17 pound, a 100% uh, Berkeley Charlene fluorocarbon is what I fish a lot. Uh, if it's extremely heavy cover, I'll go to the 20 or even sometimes 25, but normal cover, 17 is a great line size. Okay, one other scenario, and that's the, that's the other uh, 30 to 40% of the time, I'm using braid. Either braid straight to the bait, or braid with a real short fluorocarbon leader, super short fluorocarbon leader. And I'm selecting braid with these jigs in two main scenarios. The one is when I'm fishing cover that is so thick and nasty 
that I'm even worried with 20 and 25 pound fluorocarbon. So like a forest of trees, uh, matted grass, hydrilla, thick hydrilla. I love that braid. Uh, a lot of times I'll tie directly to the lure, especially in, in those grass situations, I tie directly to the lure. So I love braid for super heavy cover. I love braid for vegetation and grass. And last but not least, I do like braid to a fluorocarbon leader when I'm making really, really extremely long cast or fishing extremely deep water. And the reason for that is that braid has zero stretch and helps me eliminate the distance. Whether it's a bomb cast or if I'm fishing in 30, 40, 50 feet of water, I can eliminate a lot of stretch with the braid. So straight braid, braid to a floor leader, 30, 40% of the time. I really like 30 to 50 pound braid is my favorite. 40 pound Berkley X9 in green, that's the deal. That's the deal I use. And by the way, I love that on a swim jig as well. I love that combo. All right, let's get to it. If you've been following the series, this is sort of like, this is sort of like the exclamation point, the grand finale. This is the end of the fireworks show where all the fireworks go up at one time. I want to talk to you about feeling the bite, detecting the bite, and setting the hook. If I had to pick out one thing that I see new jig fishermen, new jig anglers, one thing I see them do wrong, it's detecting the bite and setting the hook right. So let's talk about that real quick. So the main thing in detecting a bite, and, and there, are, there are an endless, endless, amount of bites you can get, right? Different kind of bites, from fish that eat it on the fall, to fish that barely pick it up, to fish that slowly swim off. But I wanna give you the two basics to detecting that bite, okay? The one is how important, listen to me, how important the fall is on that jig. The initial fall. And, you know, a lot of times we're fishing this jig, we're casting and pitching to cover, right? I'm going down a bank and I look out there and I can see a stump under the water and I've got my jig and I pitch it over to that stump and I see too many anglers pitch to the cover and click right over and let it fall on a tight line. And that's honestly a real good idea what it does. If you pitch over there or cast over there and let the jig fall on a tight line, it's gonna pendulum away. If that stump is over here and you pitch to it and let it fall on a tight line, it's gonna pendulum away from the stump. It's gonna leave the strike zone. The other thing I see anglers do is they pitch over to that stump and then they let an immense amount of slack out, whether it's a backlash or whether they're not paying attention, tons of slack in the line. And by the time they pick up and feel, they probably already had a bite. That bass probably already hit it, spit it out. A jig's heavy, so they're not going to hold it forever like a weightless plastic. They're going to spit it out. The first key to detecting this strike and fishing this jig correctly is that you have to let the jig fall on a controlled slack line. So when you pitch to that stump or that dock or that break line or that break drop off or that bluff wall and that jig's falling, I want you to have a slight bow in the line or controlled slack. And you know, all controlled slack means is that as it falls, it's not falling on a totally tight line. And that's going to allow the jig to fall straight and natural. Straight down next to that cover. If you've got a, uh, 
a crawl or a move, movement made on it, it's going to fall naturally. It's going to have a lot of action. So let it fall on a semi-slack or controlled slack line. Second thing in jig detection, and remember, this is, this is hard to explain because jig bites can be so different. Some of them, man, you're going to feel like a freight train's peeling off with it. Other bites, you're going to pitch out there, and all of a sudden, you just you lose the jig. You're like, where'd it go? I, I don't feel it. So my rule of thumb, this is how I learned. I'm a big advocate of it still to this day, is when something feels different as you're fishing that jig. I don't care if you're hopping it, dragging it, swimming it, stroking it. If you throw out there and something feels weird or strange or different, set the hook. Set the hook. Remember, guys, this isn't, this isn't a weightless stick bait that they're going to eat and you could open up your bale and it would have it for an hour, right? It's not like that. These are big lead-headed jigs, a quarter to three-quarter, one ounce. When he grabs it, he feels that. He's going to take it for a little bit, and he's going to say, man, this ain't real. Poof, spit it out. So the moment you feel something strange or weird, set the hook. Set the hook. If you do that, you're going to pick up on bites a lot better. I'm here to tell you that over half of my bites don't feel like bites. Over half of my bites on a jig don't go doo, doo, doo. Maybe 20% do that. Another 20% they peel off. But 50% of my bites, it just feels strange. It feels spongy. I lose contact of the bait. i watching that line fall that on the initial fall when it's semi-slack, and I see it go doo. I see the line move. I don't feel it. I just see the line move. Anything like that, set the hook. All right, last but not least is the hook set. And look at the anatomy of this jig. Look at the anatomy of a jig. And again, on this one, we're not talking about the micro jig. We're talking about compact, full-size, football, swim jig. Look at the anatomy of a skirted jig. It's a giant single hook, even on the compact jig. It's a pretty heavy gauge single hook. It's not a crankbait. Guys, it's not a, it's not a crankbait. It's not a little light wire finesse hook. It's not a jerk bait. It's not, a, it's not any of that. It's a big single stout hook. And because of that, when you feel a bite, or you think you have a bite, or something feels different, the moment you feel that, I want you to jack that fish as hard as you can. I'm not gonna tell you this on other, a lot of other lure categories. On some, you reel into them. On some, you step back. On some, you don't even set the hook. You just reel. But on a jig, I want you to get mad at that fish. I want you to hit them as hard as you can. And my rule of thumb when I jig fish is I like to keep that rod in front of my body at all time. I don't care if you're long casting, dragging a football, pitching docks, whatever you're doing. When I throw that jig out there, I like to keep it right in front of my body. When I learned to jig fish, one of the things I did, it's a great little tip, is I would put that butt and actually touch my ribs. So it touched my ribs. And when I felt it, that was a mental clue to me that the rod's in the right position, right? So you want it in front of you, touch that butt of that rod to your ribs, and keep that as you work it, no matter how you're working it, keep that rod position in that three, two, three, two to four position, right? Keep it right here. 
And the minute that you feel a bite or you think something's gone on, hit them. And, you know, I don't, I don't really like, I don't put slack into the line and hit them. As soon as I feel it from that position, wherever I'm at, if I'm at three or two, mm, I just get into them. I don't want to do it here as I pop a hole in my wall, but I'm literally going from that two or three o'clock position straight back as hard as I can, really using my body and my rod to leverage and just, I mean, I mean, hitting them as hard as I can hit them, right? Medium heavy rod with heavy fluorocarbon or braid, hitting them as hard as you can hit them to drive that hook home. When you do that, when you get them, you hardly ever lose them. You hardly ever lose them. You hardly ever lose them because that big single hook is usually driven right into their mouth, the top of their mouth and the corner and the roof. Um, and you land a large percentage of those fish as long as you hit them hard. Big stout hook, medium heavy rods, hit them as hard as you can. Keep that rod in front of your body. Man, this was a fun series. Uh, this is the ultimate series on jig fishing. We talked about it all from size, category, color, where, when, trailer, rod, reel, line, bite, and hook set. And I'm telling you, if you're scared of jig fishing, if you don't like it, if you've never tried it, give it a try. It is one of the, if not the most versatile, all around bass lures ever created. And it catches some really big ones as well. I hope you like this series talking about jigs. Man, if you like what you're hearing, do me a favor. Before you leave, hit that subscribe button right there. See it flashing? Mash that button, subscribe to my channel. We got a lot of great content coming to you every single week. And we have a few more of these series coming your way as well. If you're already subscribed, do me a favor. Tell your fishing friends about Mike Iaconelli Fishing on YouTube. We're here to help you become a better angler. Have a good one. Try a jig. You'll catch a big one. Bye.